I have no disclosures. Patient is a 25-year-old Hispanic female who was 34 weeks and three days pregnant. She was transferred from an outside hospital with a diagnosis of pyelonephritis. Her symptoms included dysuria, nausea, and vomiting, left-sided abdominal, and flank pain. She had no past medical history. Um, her only surgical history was a C-section in Mexico at 36 weeks for oligohydramnios in 2014. Her only home medication was a prenatal vitamin. Um, on physical exam, she was a febrile. Her heart rate was 104, blood pressure of 104 over 58. Um, she had a gravid abdomen that was diffusely tender to palpation with focal rebound um, in the left lower quadrant. A renal ultrasound from the outside hospital was significant for an 11 by 8 by 9 centimeter isochoic mass inferior and medial to the left kidney. She had a white blood cell count of 25.9. Hematocrit was 32.8. Her BMP was essentially normal. Um, and she had a lactic acid of 1.2. Her UA had 31 RBCs, 10 white blood cells, and trace leukocytosterase. The OB team ordered a CT scan of her abdomen, um, which showed an incompletely imaged homogeneous mass anterior and inferior to the left kidney, which will be seen down here right there, um, and then anterior to the mass, um, it looks like there's um, almost an inseparable loop of bowel, and then um, you can notice that the, small, the rest of the small bowel that can be seen in her abdomen is fairly dilated, and then, of course, this here is what a fetus looks like on a CT scan. Um, so given the patient's finding of a uh, small bowel obstruction um, secondary to her abdomen being occupied by a 34-week intrauterine pregnancy and a 10-centimeter mass, um, as well as her degree of abdominal pain on physical exam, uh, the decision was made with the OB team to take the patient for exploratory laparotomy and C-section. Um, first, the OB team performed a uh, C-section via the patient's conveniently located vertical midline C-section scar and a viable male infant was delivered. Uh, via this same incision, we then explored the abdomen and found an approximately 14 centimeter mass attached to the anti-mesenteric border of a piece of ileum that was about three feet proximal to the ileocecal valve. The mass was necrotic and hemorrhagic. We resected it with um, the portion of small bowel it was attached to um, and performed a stapled side-to-side -side anastomosis. Um, and this is an intraoperative photo of the mass. The pathology showed bland spindle cell proliferation with an immunoprofile consistent with a smooth muscle tumor. Um, it was SMA and Desmond positive. Uh, it was CD117, um, also known as KIT, and DOG1 negative. There was um, no significant cytologic atypia or increased mitotic activity identified. And all these findings were consistent with a leomyoma of the small bowel. As far as her postoperative course, her NG tube was removed on post-op day four. And by post-op day five, she had a bowel movement, was tolerating a regular diet, and was discharged home. Um, her Baby was discharged from the NICU on post-op day 11. She was seen in the Orange Surgery Clinic two weeks post-op um, and was doing well. So stromal, or um, also known as mesenchymal neoplasms affecting the GI tract, are divided into two groups. The most common are GISTs. The far less common group is uh, comprised of a spectrum of tumors that are identical to those that might arise in the soft tissues throughout the rest of the body. These include lipomas, liposarcomas, leomyomas, and leomyosarcomas. Um, by light microscopy alone, the distinction among GISTs and other tumors in the differential, especially leomyomas, can be difficult. Um, the distinction is usually based on immunohistochemical analysis. Um, GISTs almost universally express KIT, 
um, like I said earlier, also known as CD117 and DOG1 and leomyomas express SMA, Desmond, or both, unlike GISTs. Um, GI leomyomas have a similar morphologic appearance to leomyomas um, found in other organs. They typically arise from the muscularis propria and their growth can be intraluminal, extraluminal, or both. They range in size from less than half a centimeter to as large as 30 centimeters. Um, on microscopy, there are fascicles of benign appearing spindle cells without nuclear atypia. Uh, their vacuoles do not contain fat or mucosubstances, which differentiates them from liposarcomas and carcinomas. Um, and they are most commonly found in the esophagus, where they are often detected incidentally on a barium swallow or endoscopy performed for other reasons. Um, and in the smooth or and in the small intestine, uh, smooth muscle tumors are most commonly found in the jejunum, where 83 to 86 percent of cases are gists. Small intestinal mesenchymal tumors are often large at diagnosis, commonly presenting with ulceration and bleeding. Um, other presenting symptoms include pain, weight loss, a palpable mass, um, and/or obstruction. General management principles include surgical remover, removal if the tumor becomes symptomatic, enlarges to greater than one centimeter, uh, shows structural changes during surveillance, and any time malignancy is suspected. And post-treatment follow-up is not required for leomyomas. The malignant version, uh, leomyosarcoma, is extremely rare in the GI tract. On microscopy, the cells are characteristically elongated, with an abundance of cytoplasm, um, and multinucleated giant cells are common. Most of them are high grade and have far less favorable outcomes when compared to GISTs. As I mentioned earlier, um, leomyomas tend to go undetected until they become quite large and can have interesting presentations. These are two case reports of parasitic leomyomas. So in one case, a 48-year-old female presented with abnormal uterine bleeding, and on workup was found to have a leomyoma of the small bowel. And in this other case, a 45-year-old female presented with small bowel obstruction was found to have a leomyoma of the omentum. In both cases, the patients had a history of fibroids. Um, so for parasitic leomyomas, the theory is that Uterine leomyomas arising as subserosal projections from the uterus latch on to other organs for their blood supply. Um, it has also been hypothesized that these leomyomas arise as a result of accidental seeding during morselation of uterine fibroids during um, surgery for removal. In another case report, a 69-year-old male presented with four days of worsening abdominal pain, distension, nausea, vomiting, obstipation. His only past surgical history was bilateral open inguinal hernia repairs. And a CT scan showed a transition point in the distal ilium. He failed non-operative management and on exploration was found to have a mobile intraluminal mass in the terminal ilium that was removed via enterotomy. And this turned out to be an intraluminal leomyoma that had detached from its pedicle and gotten lodged in the smaller lumen of the distal ilium basically acting like an obstructive um, bezoar. Uh, the next few slides cover some points on the management of pregnant patients undergoing non-obstetric surgery. Uh, in a series of 720,000 pregnant women, there were 5,405 non-obstetric operations for an incidence of 0.75%. Um, and as shown in this table, the most common reasons are appendicitis and cholecystitis. A study of over 7,100 women with appendicitis in pregnancy reported conservative management to be associated with an increased risk of septic shock, venous thromboembolism, and peritonitis. A number of large studies have investigated outcomes of pregnancy after non-obstetric surgery. A 2005 um, systematic review evaluated 54 studies on surgery during pregnancy from 1966 to 2001. Um, and some key findings included that the overall rate of miscarriage in pregnant women exposed to surgical intervention in the first trimester was 10.5 percent, 
which is similar to that in the general obstetrical population. And the overall rate of major birth defects at 2% was not increased. Um, the following are some physiologic changes to be aware of in a patient that is pregnant, including increased cardiac output up to 50% above baseline. Um, this results from increased preload from a rise in blood volume, decreased vascular resistance, and increased maternal heart rate by 15 to 20 beats per minute. There is an increase in tidal volume and respiratory drive that causes respiratory alkalosis, and oxygen consumption increases by 20%. Um, there is a mild hemodilutional anemia and mild leukocytosis, um, as well as hypercoagulability, and GERD occurs in up to 30 to 50% of patients. I think it's good to know that pregnant patients have a greater risk of carotid puncture during uh, central line placement due to the tendency of the internal jugular vein to overlie the carotid artery um, in pregnancy. And for laparoscopic procedures, Procedures predicted to last greater than 45 minutes. Use of low molecular weight heparin is suggested, and then uh, mechanical thromboprophylaxis is a reasonable alter alternative for shorter procedures. Um, antibiotics with a good safety profile in pregnant women include cephalosporins, penicillins, erythromycin, and clindamycin. Supine patients beyond 18 to 20 weeks of gestation um, should be positioned with a 15 degree left lateral tilt to reduce aortal cable compression. And then um, an interesting fact, um, apnea leads to uh, more rapidly uh, or more rapid desaturation in pregnant women compared to non-pregnant women. So a healthy, fully pre-oxygenated non-pregnant woman will decrease her saturation level from 100 to less than 90 percent in about nine minutes of apnea and it takes only three minutes for a term uh, pregnant patient to reach the same degree of desaturation and it takes about 90 seconds in a morbidly obese pregnant patient. Um, the choice between ketamine, propofol, and etomidate is usually based on provider preference for pregnant patients and the clinical status of the patient, such as presence of arrhythmias, hypertension, preeclampsia. Um, none of these agents has, have been clearly shown to be teratogenic or to have adverse effects on human brain development. Succinylcholine and the non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents may be used as clinically indicated. Um, these drugs have no direct effect on the fetus um, as, these, as they do not cross the placenta in clinically significant concentrations. Uh, pain control in pregnancy is an area of ongoing controversy, especially when it comes to opioids. Uh, Tylenol has demonstrated efficacy and safety at all stages of pregnancy in standard therapeutic doses, although there have been weak associations made with its use during pregnancy with asthma, ADHD, and cryptorchidism. Uh, use of NSAIDs other than Low-dose aspirin for more than 48 hours can cause in utero constriction of the ductus arteriosus as early as uh, 24 weeks of gestation. Um, there is an association between opioid use during the first month of embryonic development and neural tube defects. Although a 2015 US FDA safety announcement stated that um, further investigation is needed before we can determine whether the weight of evidence supports the presence of an increased risk of neural tube defects related to opioid exposure in early pregnancy. Um, caution should be used also in giving opioids to pregnant patients in labor because you can get fetal respiratory depression, especially in premature neonates. And I think that what can be concluded taking into consideration those points is that in general, short-term episodic use of opiates is probably safe in pregnancy. And in women who are breastfeeding, Tylenol and ibuprofen is safe, and short-term short opioids are safe too, uh, with counseling that the baby needs to be monitored for respiratory depression and to try breastfeeding before taking the medication. Um, so in conclusion, GI leomyomas, especially the small bowel, are often clinically silent until they bleed or grow large enough to cause local mass effect. GISTs are the most common type of stromal neoplasm affecting the GI tract. 
Uh, they differ clinically and pathogenetically from true leomyosarcomas and leomyomas. Non-obstetric surgery does not appear to negatively impact obstetric outcomes, including rates of miscarriage and congenital malformations. Um, and although abdominal discomfort, nausea, vomiting, and constipation can be a normal part of pregnancy, peritoneal signs are never normal in pregnant women. Nausea and vomiting are not normal manifestations of advanced pregnancy, and when they occur with other symptoms like abdominal pain, fever, diarrhea, headache, or localized abdominal findings, they require thorough evaluation. And surgical delay has been associated with uh, worsened outcomes, particularly for infectious surgical indications such as appendicitis and cholecystitis. Um, and for anyone who wasn't here last week, I wanted to use my cost of medicine slide to reemphasize that the cost of one vial of Expirel, which we definitely did not use in this service case, is $445. So, any questions? I have questions, comments. Um, all right, let's, let's reiterate a few points that you made. Um, one of them, especially for the medical students, be going into other uh, specialty practices. Peritonitis is not caused by pregnancy, and so a patient that's pregnant with peritonitis has another cause, right? Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think another thing for the benefit of the residents, realize that there is almost always an oral exam question on the surgery boards that, that, that involves a pregnant woman. And so knowing at what point it is safe to operate on a patient uh, is clear. And with, uh, with the malpractice liability crisis, at least in years past, it's, it's ebbed a little bit now, at least in Tennessee, but it hasn't necessarily nationwide. You know, we, we became so frightened by potential harm to the fetus uh, that, you know, the, the idea that you should almost never do anything to a woman who's pregnant uh, really got to be a problem. So let's reiterate now for everybody, when is it safe to operate on a patient who's pregnant? Uh, at any time. At any time, yes. basically, you know, depending on the balance of uh, other symptoms. Um, uh, okay, so uh, another point that uh, you, you made about the, about different drugs and whether or not uh, they crossed the barrier for breastfeeding. Uh, a point came up yesterday, and uh, this is a different point, but since you're talking about pregnant patient, uh, in terms of uh, breast cancer treatment, Dr. Witherspoon made the point, and I've certainly experienced it as well, in operating on people with, uh, with breast disease, especially mastectomies, you know, as uh, with all of the outcry about the safety of uh, breastfeeding and how it's so much better for everybody, People are almost religiously attached to that. But I can tell you, if you have to operate on a patient who is breastfeeding for a mastectomy, you are looking at a bloodbath. And so you need to be sure that the patient understands that yeah, because it's, it's the one circumstance in breast surgery where you, you flat can have to give a bunch of blood if you can't get the patient to stop breastfeeding. And so a period of, of uh, cessation of breastfeeding is really important in that situation. So it's not dealing with your case, but it does deal with the, with the obstetrical issues that we don't see every day. So just, just be aware of that. One of the points you made about, <clears throat> about during surgery and mechanical prophylaxis, are we not still using mechanical prophylaxis on pretty much everything when we do laparoscopic surgery? Okay, just wanted to be sure about that. I mean, if we're not, uh, we think we ought to be, because I think that's one of the, Dr. Rowe, and, and when we first started doing laparoscopic surgery, we pretty much insisted on that, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's just, a, that's a routine. I wanted to be sure that that was a routine. Yeah. I think anything more than that, you know, it, it may be difficult, uh, different from one uh, patient to another. So, uh, 
You want to make a point, uh, Heath? Yeah, I just had – that was really good. A uh, couple questions. Number one, what were her symptoms from? Was she obstructed? Was it from the mass? Was it necrotic? And I think it was both because um, she did have rebound tenderness really in her left lower quadrant, and that's where that mass was located when we found it. Um, and it had torsed, I think, on its blood supply, and that's why it had become necrotic because it had become so large. And then I th she was also obstructed. I mean, her CT showed dilated bowel. Um, she had symptoms of obstruction, and on X-LAP, her bow small bowel was dilated proximal to the mass, and I think it was from just her abdomen was just – she had a large uterus, and then she had a large mass. Um, she may have volvulized that part of the bowel a little bit around that mass also. So – and secondly, it had, did you read anything? Does pregnancy and the hormones, whatnot, that, that come with that, does that increase, cause them to increase in size, or is there any correlation with that? And it's just curious why it suddenly it had this issue. Yeah, I, I didn't read anything about that. Um, they're already so uncommon that there's kind of just like case reports on these leomyomas, especially the ones in the GI tract and attached a small bowel. Um, so I don't know if her pregnancy affected its growth rate. I just think that she had it and maybe it was not noticeable until she also had a 34 week pregnancy in her abdomen too. Well, well, the, the, the necrosis is the thing that probably led to her having symptoms, wasn't it? I mean, she had, she had symptoms prior to this. It was. Hard. See what I mean? I mean, yeah. Did, did she know she had a problem other than being pregnant? That's, that's a problem. But did she know she had anything different? No. Uh, before this, so no. I mean, I think you'd have to you'd have to theorize at least that the that the necrosis of the tumor might have been the etiologic factor here. And and that was the thing I wanted to ask you about because you think it, it it had undergone some element of volvulus of the tumor on its pedicle or up the, at the, is that, is that what we think is the reason? Because, I mean, yeah. I've yeah. seen a number of leomyomas over time, and I'm, I don't think I've ever seen one with necrosis, is that, you know, in, in it. Uh, whereas you see necrosis in cancers, you know, fairly frequently if they're large. Uh, I'm so sure, um, the pathology report said something specifically about it looking like the, it had torsed and the blood supply had been okay. affected. Yeah, I, I would think, would think possibly so. Yeah, Bob, you have? Yeah, that was a great uh, factoids about uh, pregnancy. It'd get your reference on that or for everybody, really. Um, and this wouldn't necessarily be a question for you, but maybe from the faculty, common thing is uh, uh, gallbladder disease and pregnancy. And, and uh, how late uh, in pregnancy uh, do people feel safe uh, trying to... Uh, do a laparoscopic approach and what are some of the solutions perhaps if they're very late stage pregnancy and you don't feel that that's possible. Yeah, those are good. I was going to see if anybody wanted to chime in. Dr. Uh, Rowe, you have an opinion about that? Unless you have to, try to, try to avoid getting late, third, getting into third trimester. Yeah. You try not to do try that. Try to avoid that. Trip. Yeah. I mean, it's late, you can precipitate labor, and difficult to see. Well, do we still try to wait through the first trimester and do it in the second trimester if we can? We do that, do we not, just to try to possibly avoid any teratogenic agents that we'd use to put them to sleep and all that sort of thing. Is that not true? But second trimester and then the third trimester, what, what's your opinion, Bob? What, what about it? Uh, I think it's kind of an individual thing and in getting into the third trimester. We had a lady just recently 27 weeks pregnant and she was pretty obese and short and stocky and the fundal height was pretty high and uh, she was pretty symptomatic. She couldn't eat, wouldn't leave the obstetrical unit. Uh, so we wound up having to put a cholecystostomy tube in her and say, look, this is what you got to do for a couple of weeks because, uh, you know. You did that laparoscopically then or? No. Open. Radiology with the uh, ultrasound. Oh, guy. interventional radiology test. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, so plan to do then a so you can cholecystectomy. Come back, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try and schedule your cholecystectomy yeah. during your hospitalization right. for your delivery. Right. 
Go back to your patho your operative pathology slide, if you would. Turn the lights down, John. Yeah, Don. Yeah, just a question about uh, DVT prophylaxis or anticoagulation during pregnancy, and uh, I guess the low molecular weight heparins are probably the anticoagulant of choice. Uh, warfarin, particularly during the first trimester or so, is contraindicated because it's felt to be really teratogenic. So Warfarin is supposed to be? Supposed to be teratogenic. Okay. Uh, yeah. And you should avoid using Coumadin in these patients. Uh, I think heparin and, and low molecular weight heparins are probably okay to use, uh, as best I can tell. We try to avoid that. So. I think that's an important point to remember. Okay. All right. I, this <clears throat> this particular slide. You you said you did a side to side stapled anastomosis, right? Yes. Functional end to end. Huh? Functional end to end. Functional end to end. I mean, it's just the way you staple it. Is okay. Doesn't make it a side to side. Well. You know, this one, uh, the distal bowel does not appear significantly decompressed, right? I mean, this is proximal here. It's a pretty significant difference in them, though. And just for what it's worth, I mean, this is this is old, but I can tell you that, that see how dimitous that is? And mm -hmm. that's not. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, y'all have heard me, the faculty have heard me say this before. I think it's ill-advised to put a staple in in a bowel, in bowel that's that edematous. Because that staple's going to be the same thickness regardless of what you do, whereas with suture you can vary, you can vary that. I still think somebody here ought to do a study of that sometime. We've looked at it before, and actually uh, Dr. Smith did, Lisa Smith did as a resident, or maybe, maybe after she started on the faculty, but we had some problems with it. I think Dr. Barker was involved with it too, but I just point that out to you. If that if that were more decompressed and thin like it is frequently chronic, I really think it, I feel strongly that you ought to really think about that because you can, as I said, vary the tension that you put on that suture and keep it from cutting through. Dr. Barker, you want to? Sir, I, I, I pretty much agree with that. This uh, uh, staple worked okay on this. I generally use, and this is just sort of my belt and suspenders technique, I, I generally reinforce all of these stapled anastomoses in any patient that is at high risk with a complete uh, line of Lembert sutures all the way around. I turn the corners in uh, and make sure that I sort of use that staple line as the uh, as the internal so you're suture using line. it as your your internal yeah, you're right uh, but okay. I generally well, turn I mean, all well, of those in that's the point in. I mean if, if you cover it up it's okay I guess yeah. but uh, I just I know we we have we have some patients I'm pretty I'm pretty sure went to uh, you know six feet under a lot earlier than they needed to because of uh, trying to sow a demitus, or try to staple a demitus bowel. Yeah, the disparity between the wall thickness is something you really have to pay attention to, and yeah. there's some yeah. patients that you should not. Well, staple. this one wasn't even that great, although although you could tell a difference. You, you know, being there before, you could see that bowel proximal with the demitus that is a distal just didn't happen to be that chronically decompressed, but it certainly was not a demitus. Any other questions or comments? Excellent uh, review, and especially that about ob obstetrics. I mean, I'd encourage you. If she has a copy of her slides about that, that's a that's a good thing to have in just to have briefly reviewed because it's a, of course it's a it's a real problem for you as a general surgeon, but it's also a frequent board question. So, Dr. Tanner. All right. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Richie Tanner, one of the third year residents uh, here to talk about interesting case, multiple endocrine neoplasia plasia type 2B. I'd like to thank Dr. Rowe for allowing me to present this patient. I have no disclosures. <clears throat> uh, the objectives will present the case, then talk about thyroid cancer, and then MEN2, as well as pheochromocytoma, and then end with the cost of medicine. So our patient, this was in, uh, at the end of 2013, a 16-year-old female. Uh, she was referred uh, from her primary care doctor when thyroid nodules were found on a routine physical exam. She did get an ultrasound prior to coming to Dr. Rowe's office that showed uh, nodules in 
uh, both sides of her thyroid, uh, both the right and left thyroid gland, uh, the largest on the right side at nearly four centimeters, and there were some uh, cal calcifications present. Uh, she denied any symptoms whatsoever, completely uh, asymptomatic, no dysphagia, or hoarseness, or tenderness, um, no weight changes. Uh, and this is just a representative uh, picture of what some suspicious nodules look like. Uh, you can see here uh, calcifications, uh, irregular borders, that's suspicious, a kind of speculated appearance, more calcifications, and then nodules uh, taller than it is wide. Uh, patient had no past medical history. Uh, family history, <clears throat> um, she had an unknown thyroid disorder in a grandparent. Uh, but there were no cancers or any types of adrenal tumors or hypercalcemia. On physical exam, uh, she was afebrile, um, her vitals within normal limits. Of note, she was uh, in the 50th to 75th percentile in height, yet she was only in the 3rd to 10th percentile in weight. <clears throat> and she had a uh, thin, uh, a long slender build uh, with long thin extremities, and then she had some irregular appearing tongue with large lips uh, it just appeared abnormal. And then on her neck, she had uh, nodules uh, palpable uh, bilaterally, but they were non-tender and there was no evidence of lymph adenopathy. Uh, so in a nutshell, or in summary, she had multiple thyroid nodules that were some in appearance and an apparent marfanoid body habitus. So um, an ultrasound guided FNA was obtained. Um, the ultrasound guided FNA showed a multinodular goiter on the right side, had a 3.7 centimeter nodule with some calcifications. There was also a smaller nodule on the left side. <clears throat> and then in the left, uh, level four lymph nodes, and we'll talk about the levels of the nodes uh, in a little bit, uh, there was um, a one centimeter uh, hypoechoic uh, node that was, um, Ill, uh, it was abnormal appearing. Uh, both the large right-sided nodule as well as the lymph node were biopsied, and they both were suspicious for medullary thyroid cancer. So medullary thyroid cancer, it's a neuroendocrine tumor of the parafollicular or C-cells of the thyroid gland, and the hallmark of medullary thyroid cancer is it produces calcitonin. Um, only 3 to 5 percent of all thyroid cancers are medullary thyroid cancer, and the vast majority of them are sporadic, although a quarter of them are related, to have a familial uh, in nature. Uh, these generally uh, present as a solid thyroid nodule, and then up to 70% of the time, they're clinically detectable nodes at presentation, and then up to 10 to 15% of the time, there are distant uh, metastases, uh, most common to the lungs, bone, and liver. So this is kind of a busy slide, but it's an al algorithm of kind of how to work up um, medullary thyroid cancer uh, preoperatively. So I just want to highlight a few points. Uh, so first, here you want to determine the extent of the disease in the neck. So you get another ultrasound uh, or ultrasound of the neck, uh, which we did, and then you want to measure uh, levels of the calcitonin and CEA, and we'll talk about that briefly. And then, if possible, you want to get uh, genetic testing because uh, it. Uh, to look for um, RET mutations, and we'll talk about that. And then you also want to talk, look for coexisting uh, tumors such as pheochromocytomas and primary hyperparathyroidism. And this is kind of a summary of that slide. So to determine the extent of the disease in the neck, you want to get the calcitonin and the CEA. Um, and if calcitonin is elevated, greater than 500 uh, picograms per milliliter, then you worry about metastases, so you want to get additional imaging. And then CEA is going to be elevated in more advanced cancers. And then to rule out coexisting tumors, you want to get, um, you use biochemical testing, so you can get a plasma fractionated metanephrine to rule out pheochromocytomas, or you can, and you can check serum calcium uh, to rule out hyperparathyroidism. So if your serum calcium is normal, then you know you don't have hyperparathyroidism, but if you're calcium was elevated, then you would get a, uh, you also checked a PTH, um, and then the diagnosis of primary hyperthyroidism is having um, elevated calcium uh, with an elevated or abnormally uh, normal <coughs> uh, PTH level. And then also, uh, like we said, genetic testing to look for RET mutations. So our patient 
Uh, again, rem remembering that you want to get imaging for an elevated calcitonin. Her calcitonin was 6200, uh, which is quite elevated. And then her CEA was elevated as well. So she got an octreotide scan, which we'll, I'll show you uh, a picture of momentarily. And then pheochromocytoma and hyperparathyroidism were ruled out because her plasmodinephrines were normal and her serum calcium was normal. So octreotide scan <clears throat> uh, showed intense uh, uptake in the thyroid gland but no evidence of metastasis. The way an octreotide scan works, uh, these neuroendocrine tumors, uh, especially the medullary thyroid cancer, has somatostatin receptors on its surface, so the octreotide is taken up and can be seen um, with the gamma rays. And then specifically, uh, and we'll talk about the surgical approach to medullary thyroid cancer in a little bit as well, but we know that, um, you know, you do a total thyroidectomy with a central neck dissection, and we will talk about that. Uh, but to determine if you do lateral neck dissections, you have to look for evidence of disease. We know we had disease on the left side because we had the abnormal uh, lymph node that was biopsied and showed medullary thyroid cancer. Uh, but the octreotide scan would also show uh, right-sided disease if any was there, and there was none uh, noted. So in uh, January of 2014, the patient got a total thyroidectomy uh, with a central neck dissection and a left modified radical neck dissection. So in general, with medullary thyroid cancer, um, you will do a total thyroidectomy with a central neck dissection. The reason is, remember we talked that we showed you that uh, 50 to 70 percent of the time uh, the, there are central nodes already involved. And then the patient got a left modi modified radical dissection as well because there was evidence of disease on that side. <clears throat> this here is a review of the uh, levels of the neck. So the central neck dissection is level six, and that's here. And this submandibular is level one, and then two through five are the lateral, is the lateral neck. So for the central neck dissection, uh, it's important to know the boundaries. So superiorly, we've got the hyoid bone. Inferiorly, we've got the suprasternal notch, and then laterally, we have the bilateral carotid sheaths. And again, 50 to 70% of the time, medullary thyroid cancer has spread uh, to the central nodes by the time uh, the patient presents. And it's also important to know that if calcitonin is really low, like less than 20, um, nodes are rarely involved. So the modified radical dissection was indicated because of the evidence of uh, lymphadenopathy on the left side, and with the modified radical dissection, that's going to include levels uh, one through four. And like I showed you before, one is the submental, and then, excuse me, two through five are the lateral neck. Um, and this is different from, so radical neck dissection would include taking the spinal accessory nerve, sternocleidomastoid, and internal jugular vein, but with a modified radical, you will preserve these structures. And then again, the boundaries of the modified radical dissection are the mandible superiorly, the clavicle inferiorly, the carotid sheath medially, and then the trapezius muscle laterally. What, what do you remove, though? Go back to uh, You'll remove all of the uh, soft tissues, that could, any of the alveolar type tissues that would have nodes in them, potentially. But you don't remove muscle? Unless it... If for some reason it's involved, then you, you would okay. remove it. All right. Yes, Thank sir. You. So the intraoperative findings on the right side, um, the nodule essentially comprised the entire lobe, and on the left side there was a palpable nodule. Uh, there was no gross lymphadenopathy on the right side um, in the central right neck, but on the left side there were multiple um, worrisome nodules. And here's a picture of the pathology. You can see this large... Uh, right lobe. So the pathology report shows medullary thyroid cancer uh, was bilateral, had three separate areas of uh, tumor involvement. Uh, there was no extra thyroidal extension. Uh, the largest node was four centimeters on the right side. And then there were also uh, two out of three central uh, or level six nodes positive and 11 out of 27 of the lateral neck were positive. So the pathologic stage was a T3 N1B. And this is a very busy slide, but this is um, the TNM staging, I just wanted to highlight our patient. So um, real quickly, T1 through 3 has to do with the tumor itself. So a T1 tumor is going to be less than 2 centimeters. A T2 tumor is going to be greater than 2 centimeters but less than 4 centimeters. A T3 is going to be greater than or equal to 4. 
uh, but limited um, to the thyroid or with uh, only minor invasion of the strap muscles. And then T4 is going to be more advanced with uh, extra thyroidal invasion. So our patient, it was four centimeters and limited to the thyroid, so it's a T3A tumor. <clears throat> it's N1B for its nodes because there was metastasis to uh, the left lateral neck. If there were just central nodes involved, it would be an N1A. And there was no evidence of distal metastasis, so the overall staging of this tumor is T4A. So the diagnosis is stage 4A, uh, medullary thyroid cancer. And it's important to know that um, medullary thyroid cancer recurs in up to 50% of the time, so uh, surveillance is important after surgery. And then the 10-year survival rates uh, for medullary thyroid cancer range from 100% for stage 1 all the way down to uh, 21 percent for stage four. So again, this is how uh, one should manage uh, patients uh, with surveillance following, uh, following thyroidectomy for medullary thyroid cancer. Um, again, it's pretty busy, but I just want to point out a couple things. So you can kind of break this down into three categories. Um, so postoperatively, you want to continue surveillance with routine um, six months to, a, to annually. Um, Physical exams, ultrasounds of the neck, you also want to measure um, CEA and calcitonin. So the three kind of levels here, if you continually don't detect any calcitonin, then you just, uh, or, or some of the normal range, you continue your annual exams. And then these next two columns or areas here is if you do detect calcitonin, but it's not very elevated, um, then you will shorten your interval of follow-up um, but if it is elevated, uh, you know, greater than 150 picograms per milliliter here, then you want to get some imaging to rule out metastasis. So our patient, uh, she did see a genetic counselor before surgery, but didn't actually get the uh, genetic testing until afterwards. Uh, but when she did get her testing, it was positive for a, a mutation in the M918T um, RET gene. So therefore, the diagnosis is MEN2B. So what is multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2? It's an autosomal dominant disorder with very high penetrance, and there is a mutation of the RET proto-oncogene on chromosome 10. It's found in 1 out of 30,000 uh, people in general population. Uh, the vast majority of these is a 95% are MEN2A, whereas only 5% are MEN2B. So this uh, table here kind of breaks down. So classically, MEN2A is going to include medullary thyroid cancer, pheochromocytomas, and primary hyperparathyroidism. There are some other variations of MEN2A. But MEN2B is going to include medullary thyroid cancer with pheochromocytomas, and then some other things such as morphinoid body habitus, uh, mucosal neuromas, or intestinal ganglioneuromas, which are uh, benign tumors that are associated with MEN2B. And here's a comparison between the two. <clears throat> you notice that the, they both have a 100% um, of the time medullary thyroid cancer will be found, and up to 50% in both uh, will have pheochromocytomas. But the big difference is in MEN2A, you'll have primary hyperparathyroidism, but there's none found in MEN2B. So with MEN2, um, you want to suspect MEN2 in any patient that has either medullary thyroid cancer or pheochromocytoma, uh, but especially when the patient is young, if they're multicentric tumors, or if there's a family history. And you can diagnose MEN2 several ways. You can diagnose it both clinically based on characteristics, uh, but the best way to do it is with genetic testing because uh, the genetic testing can identify specific mutations, which can therefore uh, help dictate screening and uh, surveillance. So here is the criteria for getting uh, genetic testing. Uh, in our patient, uh, you know, there was no family history at all of um, MEN2 or any thyroid or, or um, cancers or, or any pheochromocytoma, so um, this was a parent sporadic uh, case or an index case. Uh, so she was young, less than 35, and she had multicentric tumors on her thyroid, uh, so she'd qualify for genetic testing. And then it's also important to know that once you have a um, patient with MEN2, you want to get the first and second degree family members tested as well. So the next few slides are going to kind of uh, look at the specific mutation and kind of how it relates to severity and when you should screen. So 
uh, this uh, chart here shows the mutations and then the youngest age at diagnosis uh, in the literature of thyroid cancer. So again, this is our mutation is 918, and they've found thyroid cancer as young as nine months. So this is how you uh, monitor for thyroid cancer based on the mutation. And on the next couple slides, you'll see that the risks are broken down into the highest, high, and moderate. And again, our mutation is the highest risk. So there's no annual screening for medullary thyroid cancer because it's found so young. So the recommendation is prophylactic uh, thyroidectomy within the first few months of life. And then you can see for these other uh, risk classes, you will begin screening at three years and five years um, <clears throat> respectively, but you'll still do prophylactic thyroidectomies. And then again, this is looking at pheochromocytomas and hyperthyroidism. Our patient is in the highest risk group, so she should, well, somebody with a mutation in uh, this oncogene, or this codon, should begin annual screening for pheos at age 11, uh, but then again, not for hyperthyroidism because this mutation is specific to MEN2B. These other ones are MEN2A, which would have uh, the possibility of having hyperthyroidism. So surveillance, uh, we've talked about the, you know, medullary thyroid cancer. Um, you know, you'll screen them after surgery, uh, check calcitonins, do physical exams, ultrasounds. Um, and then for the pheochromocytomas, you will uh, screen with annual biochemical testing. And then if that's elevated, you'll get imaging. So <clears throat> after surgery, our patient went along for a couple years, two and a half years, and her plasma and nephrons uh, were all normal. And then in May of 16, which is about two and a half years after her major thyroid cancer surgery, she presented uh, still asymptomatic, um, but her screening plasma and nephrons were elevated, and they were three times the upper limit of normal. So at that point, um, it was determined she likely had a pheochromocytoma, so to confirm that, you get a CT scan. Uh, but it's important to um, know about the alpha blockade, because people who have catecholamine secreting tumors uh, with stress, um, various other inciting events, they could have adrenergic storm, which can cause hemodynamic stability, instability. So, um, <clears throat> and there have been studies that show that the contrast used in the CT scans uh, can also incite um, adrenergic storm in patients um, who have catecholamine secreting tumors. So the patient was alpha blocked with phenoxybenzamine and they got a CT scan that showed a three centimeter right adrenal mass. So we're coming down here and we see the, and this is on the right side, but you see the left kidney looks normal. And on the right side, right here, you see this mass where the adrenal gland should be. And I've got a coronal image as well. Again, right here. So at that point, it was determined that the patient had a pheochromocytoma. So pheochromocytoma is a catecholamine secreting tumor that arises from the chromaffin cells of the adrenal medulla. Uh, the vast majority of these things are benign, only 10% are malignant. And the way you determine uh, microscopically benign and malignant pheochromocytomas appear identical, uh, but they're, known, they're called malignant if they are infiltrative or if they metastasize. Um, so of the chromaffin cell tumors, 85% are pheos, whereas 15% are paraganglionomes paragangliomas. Uh, and paragangliomas are uh, tumors that are found in other parts of the body, often along the aorta and the abdomen, but they're extra adrenal. Um, so pheos, 60% uh, are sporadic with 40% being familial. And as we talked about for MEN2, there's a prevalence of nearly 50%. Um, and then with MEN2 and the familial ones, uh, the vast majority of these are bilateral. Pheochromocytomas are symptomatic only about half the time, and you know, starting in med school and all the way through our app sites, you know, it's always tested on the classic triad of a pheo, episodic headache with sweating, tachycardia that's associated with hypertension. Uh, that's the classic uh, triad of symptoms. And then remember, we screen with biochemical testing and confirm with imaging.
and the treatment is adrenalectomy, which is total versus partial. So there's a retrospective review here that looked at 1,200 patients with MEN2, and then 560 had pheochromocytomas. Um, <clears throat> about 80% of them got a total adrenalectomy, and the other 20% or so got a partial adrenalectomy. And the results showed that for the partial adrenalectomy, um, there was a 3% recur recurrence versus a 2% for the total adrenal, uh, but that was not statistically significant. And it also showed that steroid dependence, um, if, if you did bilateral adrenalectomies, nearly 86% of those people became steroid dependent, whereas only half of that uh, became steroid dependent with the partial adrenalectomy. So the conclusion was that doing a partial adrenalectomy can help reduce steroid dependency. So for our patient in July of 16, she got a laparoscopic right partial adrenalectomy. Uh, so preoperatively, uh, it's important to know you have to alpha blockade these patients as we talked about, they can have the adrenergic storm. Uh, and then you always alpha block before you beta block because if you beta block first, you, you can cause unopposed alpha, which can lead to, um, again, um, adrenergic storm, um, instability with uh, hemodynamics. Um, so during the case, the patient was uh, alpha and beta blocked as needed uh, with manipulation of the adrenal. Um, the medial portion of the adrenal appeared normal and it was left intact near the left adrenal vein. And the tumor itself was mo mobilized uh, with harmonic shears and divided with the GIE stapler. I have some pictures of that here. So we're on the right side of the abdomen. This is the right quadrant. This is the liver, if you're being a cava, kidney. And this is our tumor here, and you can see the retroperitoneum has started to be divided here. And again, kidney, liver up here, I've inferior vena cava, you can see the tumor. And here, again, you can see the IVC and where the adrenal vein is coming in, and we're still dissecting along these planes. And then finally, here's the tumor after it's been excised. So the pathology showed a 3.4 centimeter uh, pheochromocytoma with clear margins. So outcomes uh, for MEN2B. Do you have a picture showing the stipe where, where the staple line was? There? I do not. Where, okay. No, sir. The staple line went back behind that tumor there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Sorry. Yes, sir. So outcomes for MEN2B, it's all based on uh, medullary thyroid cancer mortality. Again, we've talked about 10-year survival. Um, you know, stage one is 100%. And our patient had stage 4A, so t technically it's 21% 10-year survival. It's also important to know the recurrence rates for medullary thyroid cancer up to 50%, as we talked about, and then pheochromocytomas can uh, recur up to 17%. So currently our patient is still being followed by Dr. Rowe and her endocrinologist. So about a year after her uh, partial adrenalectomy, um, her screening tests for her medullary thyroid cancer uh, recurrence showed the calcitonins were elevated uh, to 275, so that's above that threshold of 150. So she's gotten, she's gotten repeated physical exams, ultrasounds, and CT scans, they were all negative, so that's she's having continual surveillance there. And then a year later, in July of 2018, her plasma metanephrines were elevated again, so she got a CT scan that showed some thickening along the left adrenal gland with some questionable nodularity, but no uh, discrete um, evidence of pheochromocytoma. So the plan there is continued surveillance as well. She's still asymptomatic. So cost of medicine, uh, harmonic shears, about $477, the hospital cost. Happy to take any questions. That was a tour de force of one patient there, but uh, uh, really, Great education. Uh, Mike, you want to make some comments? I'm, I'm glad Dr. Tanner finally presented this patient. I've mean, been on to people for years to yeah. do it. Um, but I guess maybe it's better now because there's more of the story. If she'd have gotten presented initially, we wouldn't have the story of the FEO and so forth. Um, you know, really the most important thing about this is, is recognition. You know, this patient came from a pediatric endocrinologist diagnosed as just a teenager with a thyroid nodule. And from the moment 
I walked in the room and saw her, I knew exactly what she had. It was very obvious. She was in, and her parents were with her, and they're in their 40s, and they look entirely normal. And so you know she's an MEN2B index case from the moment you see her. Because of the morphinoid feature. Yeah, I mean, she, yeah. I mean as soon as she stuck <coughs> out her tongue, I mean, yeah. it was very obvious. Okay. <clears throat> and so if you're going into surgery, and even if you're not seeing a lot of uh, more unusual endocrine uh, diagnoses, but you're still going to see patients with a thyroid nodule, you might see this patient. If you're a pediatrician, you're apt to see this patient. Certainly a pediatric endocrinologist. There's a lot of internal medicine, and there's a lot of different specialties where you could encounter this patient, not just in a subspecialty practice. And it's important to recognize them differently than just your routine you know, thyroid nodule that might just need a biopsy or, or follow. So you, you want to know when to rule out a FEO before you proceed with uh, CTs and MRIs or surgery. Uh, so all, all that's very important. Uh, this patient's certainly at high risk, and, and uh, you know, we managed her with the, a partial adrenalectomy the way the way this was, you can't see the staple line. If you look at that slide, you can see some residual cortex. Right. Oh, yeah, I can there. see that. And and you got so, between that with Yeah, so, you know, and you fire a stapler across it. Now, there's a chance there's some there's some medullary cells there, and she could have a local recurrent, you know, right. a new one at some point. But, you know, you got somebody young, and if she does has one on the other side, and and the tumor ends up being right up against the vein, and, you can't really do a partial to make her totally steroid dependent this young yeah. is a big deal. Uh, you know, you'd like to have recognized it earlier. Most of your MEN2Bs, they are going to be the index case because they don't live long enough to reproduce, unfortunately. Well, I was going to ask about that now because uh, you made the point about uh, at some point along the way about doing prophylactic thyroidectomy, there, you know, there. But how would you know to test life. them? How would you know to test them? That's my question. Yeah, you don't. You 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 really don't because in MEN two A's you're more likely to certainly in MEN one, but that's yeah sort of a different okay. animal. But with the two B's, it's more difficult because the parents usually are normal. It's usually the index case. Now, we did have a two B years ago um, where we did uh, a thyroidectomy prophylactically based on Dr. Carr had seen this patient for a presumed diagnosis of Hirschsprung's. He did a rectal mucosal biopsy and the, and the patient, and they were like two years old, and they had mucosal ganglioneuromatosis. He recognized that she had a little bit of this habitus. Mm -hmm. yeah. The ears and, and, and the lips and tongue and everything, and she ended up getting testing. Calcitonin was elevated, so we operated on her based on that, even though ultrasound of the thyroid was normal. And she had, as I recall, uh, a three millimeter medullary cancer and C cell hyperplasia. So uh, you can stumble into it that way, but to know from early after birth you've got to do this, it's, it's more rare with a 2B. Okay. Any other questions or comments about this? I've got to say that. I think, you know, I've, I've been to a lot of meetings where we talk about MEN syndromes. This case and your discussion through it made it clearer to me than it's ever been before by watching this patient go through this over time. So that was a beautiful uh, presentation and recognition about the surveillance, too. Thank you for that. Well, these are two great, great cases. Thank you both. Uh, excellent presentation. Oh yeah, don't ever forget that.
obstetrics related questions on the surgery itself that they felt a little unprepared for. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What is your email address? Um, I can. It's V R N. Or if you want, to, can you email me? It's just Gates at Nadine at Gmail. Gates Nadine. Nadine. Okay. At Gmail. At Gmail. Yeah. Okay. Send me good. your email and then I'll send it to you. Okay. Thank you. So, um, what's the story? So, this lady had, um, so her CT scan isn't, like, in the Parkridge 